Ladies and gentlemen, we have one final speaker this afternoon, uh, so please do remain with us because she is truly, truly inspiring. Uh, Margaret Heffernan is a CEO, she's an author, some of you may have seen her TED Talks, um, and she is a director of RADA in Business. Uh, Margaret has published extensively her book in 2014, Willful Blindness, was named one of the best books of the year by the Financial Times, uh, and her TED Talks, in fact, have been seen by over three million people. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Margaret Heffernan. Thank you. Well, I'm impressed that some of you have the staying power to be here after what I imagine feels like rather a long day. I'm going to talk about productivity and creativity because after all the debates are over and all the politicians have gone home, tomorrow you're going to go back to work, all your members are going back to work, and the thing that they're going to be thinking about is how do I make my organization more productive, more creative, innovating to make itself sustainable? How do I keep my company relevant in a time when everything around me is changing? And that's the kind of core issue which I always focused on when I was running my businesses here, when I, folk, when I ran my businesses in the US, and now when I work with a lot of organizations, large and small, around the world. And for a long time, the answer to that question seemed to be, well, really what you need is to, to develop productivity and creativity is you need a great leader. And of course, the poster child for this uh, line of thinking was Steve Jobs, that if you could just find a Steve Jobs, everything would be fine. Now, they turned out to be in sort of short supply, but part of what we also started thinking was, well, to find or to create the Steve Jobs heroic soloist who would single-handedly drive your organization to sustainable success, what you needed to do was create a highly competitive environment in which everybody would have to fight for their life to get to the top. And we really believed for a long time that this was what indeed would make people more productive. And in the scientific world, a lot of scientists started to ask the question, well, does that really work? And one particular scientist I'm rather fond of at Emory University thought, well, let's do an experiment and find out. We're building a lot in our world on assumptions about how ideas like survival of the fittest really play out. So let's see in reality how it does. Now, he was a really um, lucky scientist, you could say because he studied productivity in chickens, much easier to measure than in humans, because in chickens, all you have to do is count the eggs. So he designed a really beautiful experiment. He, put, he went to his whole farmyard, and he selected a really productive flock of chickens, and he just left them alone for six generations. But then he decided he would do what many companies do, which is he would identify the individually most productive chickens and put them into a flock, a sort of super flock of super chickens. And every generation, he would select for the most productive and breed those. So he had a sort of average flock, and he had a super flock. And after six generations, what did he find? He found that the average flock was, in fact, more productive than it had ever been. They were all very plump, happy, fully feathered, and producing more eggs than ever. The super flock, on the other hand, all but three had died. <laughs> they had killed each other. The productivity of the few had been achieved by suppressing the productivity of the rest. And when he rolled out his findings at a scientific conference, one of the fellow scientists in the audience jumped up and said, I know those chickens. They work in my lab. <laughs> and as I've told the story around the world in all sorts of different companies and industries, there's always this little flicker of recognition where people think, wow, that's just how my company works. We have all these competitive systems to get people to the top. And they're almost, you know, they're defined by how many people fail. 
And so as this sort of information has started to, started to seep out, and as we've seen businesses become so complex that even superheroes like Steve Jobs can't encompass them all, we're seeing a real sea change. We're seeing a change in the idea of leadership, which really moves from thinking about heroic soloists, hard to find, hard to identify, hard and costly to produce, to thinking of a much more collaborative form of leadership. And, the, and what we're seeing as a consequence is that most organizations of any size now have senior leadership teams, that they're looking to groups of people to solve the hard problems in an uncertain context because they no longer believe that one outstanding individual can know enough, see enough, respond to enough, or communicate well enough to be on top of even often relatively simple organizations and industries. So what does that really mean in terms of leadership? If we're moving from a very competitive environment that is geared to produce soloists to a, to a more collaborative environment that's about teamwork, what kinds of leaders do those teams need? And why is it that, as we all know, I think, from personal experience, some teams are so much better than others? Again, there's some beautiful research on this done at MIT by a guy named Tom Malone at the Center for Collective Intelligence. And he brought in hundreds of people to solve hard problems and discovered what I suspect we all know, which is there's a rough correlation between IQ and problem solving. And when you put people into teams, they invariably prove to be better at solving those problems than individuals. So that's great. That seems to justify this shift from a competitive working environment to a collaborative working environment. But of course, what Malone really wanted to understand was, why are some teams so much better than others? And what he discovered astonished him. Because the really high achieving teams weren't the ones with the highest aggregate IQ. Just bringing in the smartest guys and occasionally gals in the room didn't really deliver great results. Neither were the high-performing teams the ones that had one or two IQ superstars in them. What characterized the most successful teams were just three things. The first was that overall they scored more highly on a test called reading the mind in the eye test. It's a broadly considered a test for empathy. It's about social connectedness. How in tune am I with you? How alert am I to your responses, to your engagement or your disengagement? How much am I conscious of the people around me? The second piece was that they found the teams that did best got roughly equal participation from everybody. In other words, there were no passengers, and neither did any single voice or couple of voices dominate. Everybody contributed. And the third thing that they found was that the most successful teams had more women in them. Now, this wasn't necessarily what they were looking for. And they themselves don't know, was this because women tend to score more highly on the reading the mind in the eye test, so you have a kind of doubling down on the empathy quotient? Or was it simply diversity per se? Might it have been achieved through ethnicity, um, gender, uh, sexual orientation and so on, they don't know. But what was so important about this research was the recognition that for truly functional teams to work, what matters most is what happens between people. It's not so much what I say as how well I connect with you. And this has profound consequences for leadership because it means who we think of as a leader. What we think of as looking like leadership and sounding like leadership may be quite different from the leaders of old. Now, one of the other things I do in my life is for 10 years I sat on the council of the Royal Academy of Dramatic Arts, and now I'm one of the directors of RADA in business. 
And we do huge amounts of training of leaders, putative leaders, aspiring leaders. And what's become so fascinating in watching this training is to discover how much of this connectedness people can acquire. Because most senior leadership teams are made of people who are fantastically good at one discipline. They may be fantastic financiers or accountants, terrific scientists doing R&D, great HR people or great supply chain people. And that doesn't guarantee that they will have this social connectedness. And I would argue in some disciplines, it may even guarantee that they don't. So then the issue is, what are you going to do about it? it? Do we really believe that all leaders are born? Or can we turn people into leaders? And what's so fascinating when you watch the kind of training that RADA does, both with its acting students and its RADA and business clients, is discovering that what they're teaching their students isn't how to be the biggest voice in the room or the biggest presence in the room. It's all about how they connect with the people that they're talking to, that they're working with. I had a fantastic and deeply privileged experience watching RADA auditions. And I thought, well, if they're looking for superstars, surely they're going to choose the most beautiful people who have this staggering presence. And what I saw in those auditions really changed a huge amount of my thinking. Because the students, the applicants who were really exciting to watch, it wasn't really what they did. And it wasn't what the other people did. It was what they gave to each other that created the sense of drama and excitement and made you want to keep watching. And when Rada in Business works with their clients, it's exactly the same thing. That it isn't just about being the tallest, the most beautiful, the loudest in the room. It's about what is the presence that I have that makes other people feel welcome, noticed, visible, and important? What is the voice I have that people want to listen to, that people can tune into, that isn't excluding them with mastery, but inviting them in with warmth and curiosity? What is the clarity of purpose that makes people feel in these unbelievably uncertain times that there is at the heart of the organization a center of calm. Because people who have that presence, people who have that clarity, people who have that calm, become the leaders that everybody around them wants to follow. And of course, really the definition of a leader is the person who makes other people feel that they want to follow that they want to speak up with the excellent ideas they have, that they want to help beyond their strict job, job definition, that they want to go the extra mile, they want to develop the extra idea, and they want to help the other people on their team collectively to develop something that is far greater than any one of them could ever develop alone. Watching clients at been rather in business has shown me a huge amount about the capacity people have, not to fake it till they make it, but to be who they are with a greater degree of connectedness to the people around them, a greater ability to listen to the ideas that are out there somewhere, and a far greater empathy to bring in the engagement, the curiosity, and the passion that the best work always inspires. We've heard a lot today about uncertainty and volatility. And I think in our heart of hearts we know we actually can't do anything about that. There will be a referendum. There will be a decision. Things will keep changing. Globalization and communications have changed the world forever. 
in ways that we're only just beginning to understand. Every industry is going to be disrupted. Every industry will have insurgents. And we're going to struggle to keep up. And what is going to help us in the midst of that turbulence are the leaders who can connect with every person in their team and their organization to bring the best out of them. I was lucky enough a couple months ago to interview General Stanley McChrystal, who ran the Joint Intelligence Task Force in Iraq a little while ago. And I said to him, you know, I know you're a great leader and all that stuff, but I don't really go for this kind of business as war metaphor. What do you think leading is really about? And he said, well, it's really simple. Great leaders are the people who connect well enough with everybody else that they become leaders too. It's what happens between people that generates that kind of secret source that we think of as sustainable leadership. Thank you very much. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I don't think any of us can help but feel a little bit humbled as we look at our own records in leadership and team leadership and management against some of the criteria that you just put forward. And I suspect many of us will go home today and think about what we've just heard. But in the meantime, are there any questions that you want to pose to Margaret after such a masterful exposition? But one just down here. Right. And one just there. Hi, Margaret. Um, Hi. Ian, Ian Jenkins, uh, Isle of Wight Chamber of Commerce. Do great leaders need charisma? Um, actually, I think they pretty specifically don't. Um, <laughs> there's some very, very fascinating research about charismatic leaders and how dangerous they are. Because charismatic leaders tend to be heroic soloists. They tend to think it's all about them. Now, what does that do? Um, unless they're absolutely perfect at everything, and we haven't found any of those people yet, um, it often excludes a huge amount of intelligence in the room. Right? So it quiets the voices that you need to hear. Um, you can look at a... Char I'm probably getting in trouble for saying this, but whatever. You can look at some very charismatic leaders like John Brown, for example, at BP, and see in his memoirs later his regret that that charisma squashed critical dissenting voices that he wished now he had listened to. And so while I think you know, charisma in terms of attracting the greatest contribution from everybody around you is really helpful, the kind of charisma that squashes it is not. And it's really striking. Um, John Lasseter, writing about the, the uh, creation of Pixar, talked very specifically about this in the context of Steve Jobs, which is he said there were many meetings at Pixar that Lasseter would say, jo say to Jobs, you cannot come because your presence is too big. People won't think for themselves. We won't have the debates we need to have. And actually, in this particular case, please butt out. Mm -hmm. And I think every good leader knows that, that, that sometimes their charisma and power is a bigger problem than it is an asset. So you, they're, they're effectively sucking the air out of the room. Yeah, absolutely. And the thing is, you know, we're talking so much these days about collective intelligence because actually in the volatility we've all been talking about today, you need multiple minds because one actually can't contain a, a real understanding of everything that's going on. It's just too complex. I'm going to take a couple more questions together if okay. I can. Ian Hay, can you were first? So do you have a microphone? Yes. Okay. Hi, Margaret. Um, Ian Haken from Yellow Brick Road in Norfolk. Um, there's a lot of talk about, um, about how we engage with millennials at the moment, yep. uh, particularly around uh, how, how, how much they want to be purposeful in their organisation. I just wonder what your view was on that and, and how, how organisations yeah. can get the best from their millennials, their, their future workforce. Yeah, it's really interesting. I was um, talking to a friend of mine, Patty McCord, who used to run HR for Netflix, and we were talking about millennials. And she finally said, oh, come off it, Margaret. We've just forgotten how rude and impatient we were when we were young. They're not that different. Well, I'm not sure she's right, but I'm very worried about putting millennials on a pedestal. I talk to a lot of organizations that kind of in despair will say to me, don't you think the millennials can sort this out, which I think is kind of frightening, 
you know, that we've given up on ourselves, so we're just going to hand it on and hope that the next generation does better. Um, I think millennials have a huge amount to offer, of course. Their comfort and openness to technology is a huge asset. But I think the institutional wisdom and memory of, of older generations has value too. Mm -hmm. And the best connections I've seen was a big construction company I worked with in the States where they had millennials mentoring veterans. And it really reduced the generational friction in the business, and they both learned a lot from each other. Okay, thank you. I'm gonna to come to the lady in the back, and then the okay. gentleman with the red tie. Those will be our final two questions, please. Um, my, uh, my question is that uh, you said the leaders are not, uh, like, they're not born. So, uh, can they be made? Well, I think they can be made, and there's a lot of evidence to suggest, you know, that investment in um, leadership, sorry, in, edu in training and education delivers a far higher return faster than investment in hardware and software. And I think it's really interesting that, you know, the, the head of IT in most companies pretty much has a blank checkbook, and the people in, char in, in charge of training, the minute there's a downturn in the market, you know, that's it. And actually, we should be doing it exactly the other way around. Um, I think it's important to recognize not everybody wants to lead, but what we do need in our organizations is people to feel that when they have an idea or a concern that is valuable and relevant to the business, that they can speak up. Huge amounts of innovation derive from people in companies um, were seeing opportunities that may not even be in their department. Um, I did some work recently on Roche that actually solved some of their hard problems just by broadcasting them to the entire organization and finding that there were people, you know, in completely different departments, different parts of the country, that when asked to contribute, had much more to contribute than anybody had ever seen before. Mm -hmm. So I think there's a lot more leadership potential in our organizations than the classic competitive structures have managed to surface. Final question from the gentleman just here. Um, Rex Rizmati, Commercial Director of International Business and Diplomatic Exchange. It's, it's a fascinating talk, and especially your remarks about charismatic leadership, yet history time and again shows that charismatic <coughs> leaders actually are the ones that are remembers rather than the others that are not. Um, in this world where uncertainty and risk aversion, well, uncertainty and risk aversion are positively correlated, yet so many leaders are scared to take yeah. responsibility, to say, as in to take on responsibility, yet they do take on responsibility where, where it's time to take credit. Does this mean that there is a vacuum of true leaders by having these non, well, these very non-risk averse people, thus giving rise to extreme views, such as unfortunately as we see um, with Donald Trump in the US? Yeah, I mean, I have to say, uh, you know, if, if, if Donald Trump is a charismatic leader, then I think my case is made. <laughs> okay. um, what I do think is that imagining that leadership is it contained in a single individual who is supposed to know everything, understand everything, and solve everything all by themselves, exactly as you say. First of all, it terrifies people who are in that role. And I mentor a number of senior chief executives, and that burden just about freezes their brain. And it's only when you can kind of talk them down from that and help them to see how much intelligence is around them that they could use that they really become outstanding leaders. This notion that it has to be all about me absolutely cripples them. And it's when they're able to connect meaningfully to the, a lot of the talent around them that they become real leaders because they're harnessing all the power and the intelligence and the creativity that's there. The other thing I'd say, and I'm sure many of you understand this, um, is that when you start interviewing entrepreneurs, as I have hundreds of them, and you ask them, why did you start your own business? The number one reason is rage. Right? I was stuck in a big old-fashioned company, and I had lots of ideas and lots of creativity, and there was no opportunity for it to come out. And the job of leadership is to bring that out, to see it, to bring it in, not to suppress it, but to connect it to other parts of the organization 
so that you develop a pipeline and a culture of innovation that keeps your company going forever. Margaret, I think uh, for all of us, they will all take something away from your conversation. If you in the audience have, ha have heard nothing to take away from the conversation, perhaps you better re-examine your leadership credentials. <laughs> Um, I think we can all agree that it's been an incredibly inspiring way to, to conclude our main speakers for the day. Margaret, thank you very, very My much. My pleasure.